Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Today, you will hear from me something different, really. We'll talk about a very important topic for those who is uh, working in critical care area. It is an ABG practical approach. ABG is step-by-step -step approach. Really, uh, a lot of people asked me to upload this lecture in uh, my channel. We'll talk today, uh, we'll try to talk very simple and to the point. First of all, you need to know what is the pH. Simply, pH equal constant, constant multiplied by bicarb over PCO2. So, acidosis means low pH. So, how can you decrease pH from HH equation? Simply, pH equal constant multiplied by bicarb over PCO2. How can you decrease the pH from this formula? First, if you decrease the bicarb, you will decrease the pH. This is metabolic acidosis. Second, if you increase the PCO2, you will decrease the pH. This is respiratory acidosis. We'll try to talk about First, and the most important for everyone working in critical care area, acid-base balance, which is metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis is step-by-step -step approach, practical approach. It is low by carb and low pH. Second step, when you face an ABG with metabolic acidosis, please go to the anion gap. Anion gap equal sodium minus chloride plus bicarb. If it is more than 12 millimole per liter or according to your lab, if it's high anion gap, look for the causes of high anion gap metabolic acidosis, which is due to production of endogenous acid or exogenous acid coming from outside. The endogenous acid could be beta hydroxybutyric acid and the keto acid, uh, acetoacetic acid and diabetic acidosis could be phosphoric and sulfate in advanced renal failure, could be lactic acid in lactic acidosis. These are all endogenous acid or uh, exogenous coming from outside like methylene, methyl alcohol, ethylene glycol, and acetyl salicylic acid. So, adding an acid to the circulation endogenously or exogenously will make high anion gap metabolic acidosis. But before leaving this point, please don't forget to compensate for hypoalbuminemia in high anion gap. So after measuring your anion gap for the patient, do adjusted anion gap, which is equal anion gap plus four, which is normal albumin, minus patient albumin multiplied by 2.5 to get the real anion gap for the patient. This is the second step. First, metabolic acidosis. Second, go to the anion gap. I need to talk about some, to clarify some point, I believe it's important before going to in deep for metabolic acidosis. What is buffer system? What's buffer system? You know about the common buffer system in the body, which is bicarb carbonic acids. What's buffer system? Simply, the buffer system in, the, in our body will convert a strong acid, whatever, endogenous, like, like lactic acidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, or exogenous, like methyl, methyl alcohol, or what, etc. The buffer system will convert this strong acid to weak acid. So, the drop of pH will be uh, less. Because a strong acid can make a big change in pH, but a weak acid will not do this big change in pH. For example, lactic acid, when enter our body, it is considered hydrogen plus lactate. We react with the bicarb buffer system, we convert to lactate, which is anion, and carbonic acid. Lactic acid, strong acid, carbonic acid is a weak acid, and it can be exhaled. So, the buffer make no change or no more change, big change in the pH. Acetoacetic acid, strong acid, will react with the bicarb, 
carbonic acid weak acid and the acetoacetate is anion so the buffer system simply will convert strong acid to weak acid so will not cause big change in the pH what about the concept of anion gap anion gap is equal sodium minus chloride plus bicarb let us consider this lactic acidosis lactic acid increase in our body what will happen it will react with a bicarb the result of this reaction will be lactate which is an anion and carbonic acid which will be converted to co2 and exhaled so adding lactic acid to the circulation will make one lactate anions and will consume one by carb what will happen to this formula anion gap will increase because there is consumption of bicarb here so sodium minus chloride plus bicarb will give high value and lactate which is produced in circulation is not measured in the formula because it is will be will be go to the anion gap will increase because we are not measuring lactate so it is hidden anion this is a concept of anion gap acetoacetic acid in diabetic ketoacidosis will react with the bicarb the end result will be carbonic acids exhaled and acetoacetate and anion what is the effect of this reaction on this formula one bicarb molecule will be consumed here and one acetoacetic acid anion will be produced but it's not included in this formula so the anion gap will increase this is the concept of high anion gap any acid endogenous due to lactic acidosis diabetic ketoacidosis renal failure or exogenous toxin from outside like ethylene glycol will do the same result will produce when react to the buffer system will produce an anion which is hidden will not measure and consume one by carb so the anion gap will increase what is the concept of delta gap delta gap this is a formula of delta gap equal the patient actual anion gap minus the normal anion gap over 24 24 which is the normal by carb minus the patient by carb what does it mean back to this simple formula endogenous acid lactic acid will react with the bicarb the end result will be lactate one anion and carbonic acid which is exhaled so from this reaction you will see very clearly for each bicarb consumed will be one anion produced this is the relation this is the normal relation of high anion gap metabolic acidosis one bicarb molecule consumed and one lactate molecule produced this is a normal what if we find consumption of bicarb loss of bicarb more than gain of anions if we see lactate is three molecules but we find here there is five or six molecules of bicarb lost what will happen what is the explanation for that the only explanation for that is there is some disease there is some disease or some pathology which is consuming and leading to loss of bicarb what is this it is normal anion gap metabolic acidosis so if you find this proportionate loss of bicarb more loss of bicarb compared to the gain of anion that means it is not only high anion gap metabolic acidosis it is accompanied and mixed with normal anion gap metabolic acidosis what if the reverse is the situation what if you find a lot of lactate without a lot of lactate production without loss of bicarb say six molecules of lactate but only lost 
three or four molecules by card. What's the explanation? The explanation is there is another disease which will produce by carb or increase by carb in our body, which is metabolic alkalosis. This is very simply, this is the policy of the concept behind the delta gap. You know this concept? This is the delta gap. It is the relation between the anion gap, the anion added to circulation and the bicarb lost uh, from circulation. If the anion gap, for, if more bicarb is lost, more bicarb is lost here in this formula, you will see the here 24, more bicarb was lost here. That means there will be associated normal anion gap metabolic acidosis because there is pathology which lead to loss of bicarb, which is normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. In this situation, the delta will be low one because if you decrease this bicarb in this formula, that means the, the formula will be below one. Say, anion gap here is 20. Okay? But the bicarb is too much lost. Bicarb is 5. You have 20 minus 12, which lead to 8. Here, 24 minus 4. It is 20. That means it's below one. Below one, if this formula below one, you are talking, you are talking about non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. If less bicarb is lost compared to the gain of uh, anions, the delta gap will be above one and there is associated metabolic al alkalosis. Say the bicarb here, only four molecules lost. That means the bicarb is 20, 24 minus 20, but more anion gap here is added. Say uh, it's 22, that means 22 minus 12, 10, and 24 minus 20 is four. That means it's above one. That means it is metabolic alkalosis. You know the concept. Very easy. Please take care of this formula. When you delta gap, patient anion gap minus normal anion gap over 24, which is normal by carb, minus patient by carb. And after that, uh, calculate. If it is less than one, there is associated non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. If it's more than one, there is accumulating metabolic alkalosis. So, first, if you face a patient with metabolic acidosis, which is low by carb and low BH, go to the anion gap. Measure the anion gap and take care, try to <clears throat> do the adjusted anion gap to correct for the albumin and get the actual anion gap. Once you get the actual anion gap, you will go to the delta gap. If high anion gap, look for delta gap, which is patient anion gap minus, as you see. If more than one, there is concomitant metabolic alkalosis. If less than one, there is concomitant normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Okay? It's very easy because usually you will see a mixed ABG, mixed acid base uh, imbalance, not uh, a simple one. Step four if anion gap is normal, it's less than 12 millimole per liter, or according to your lab, normal, it is normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Anion gap, as you see here, in, in normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, it is not like the high anion gap, which is adding acid to circulation. It is very simply loss of bicarb from the body. Normal anion gap metabolic acidosis equal loss of bicarb. And the nature of our body is with loss of bicarb, there will be a compensatory gain of chloride to keep electroneutrality of our body. So this is the nature of our body. For each loss of bicarb, will be gain of chloride. So in this formula, here is low, here is high, will compensate and the anion gap will be normal. Step four, if the anion gap of normal, look for the common causes of normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, which is diarrhea, because loss of bicarb is through GI, and renal tubular acidosis, loss of bicarb through the kidney. So this is the major major source of loss of bicarb, which is GI, diarrhea, and renal tubules, renal tubular acidosis, and the iatrogenic, which is adding chloride to circulation, so will decrease the bicarb, because as you know, our body is always compensated for increase of chloride by decreasing bicarb and vice versa, okay? 
In renal tubular acidosis, there is type 1, which is the commonest one. Urine pH always above 5.3. There is always failure of acidification of urine, even if the bicarb decreases below 15 millimole. And we will see now why. And there is nephrocalcinosis in this type. In type 2, urine pH can be can decrease below 5.3 if the bicarb is below 15 millimole and we'll see how can that occur and this accompanying glucosuria amino aciduria so-called Fanconi in so-called for Fanconi syndrome this type 1 and type 2 there is accompanying hypokalemia but there is type 4 which is hyporeninemia is associated with renal tube acidosis and hyperkalemia I need to clarify in simple way what is renal tubular acidosis type 1 or type 2 this is our proximal convoluted tubule. Very simply, there is filtered by carb here from the glomerular filtration rate will be filtered through the tubular lumen or proximal tubule here, sodium by carb. Here there is active sodium hydrogen exchanger, active bump in the proximal tubule. We'll take the sodium inside the cell and we'll get the hydrogen outside here in the, in the tubular lumen. Once hydrogen in the tubular lumen will react with the filtered by carb, will produce carbonic acid. And here is a carbonic anhydrase type 4, which shifts the reaction toward this direction. So, will consume the hydrogen to make a gradient for this active bump to work. What will happen? In this situation, here, here will be sodium will be reabsorbed, hydrogen will be excreted here, and as you see here, carbon uh, carbon dioxide will go inside where bicarb will be produced and reabsorbed. The net effect will be reabsorption of the filtered bicarb because most of bicarb sodium bicarb will be reabsorbed in the proximal tubule in more than 90% of bicarb. If there is renal tubular acidosis type 2, there is defect in this process. So, will be defect in reabsorption of this bicarbonate and will be lost. And because the bicarbonate will be lost, the pH of the urine will increase. Okay? Type. Here, this type 2 renal tubular acidosis, if the bicarb drop below 15 urine pH will start to normalize and will become below 5.3 what's the explanation of that it's very simple because the capacity this renal tubule has a low capacity to reabsorb by carb but if the bicarb level drop below 15 millimole per liter so the filtered load of bicarb in the proximal tubule will be less will decrease because the concentration of bicarb decreases. So the chromatic filtration rate of the bicarb will filtrate will decrease with bicarb because the level in the blood decreases. This decrease in the bicarbonate load in the proximal tubule will make this proximal tubule, the, the weak proximal tubule, will be able to reabsorb this small amount and the pH will be normalized. So the issue here and the trick point here. In, in renal tubular acidosis type 2, if the bicarb drop below 15, the BH can be normalized. The BH of the urine can be normalized. But what is the situation for type 1, which is the commonest one? Here is a collecting tubule. In the collecting duct, there is an active bump for secretion of hydrogen and for secretion of hydrogen exchange to potassium. This is an active bump. And here, the carbonic anhydrase will make the reaction in the shift the reaction to this direction to increase the production of hydrogen to enhance the bump for excretion of hydrogen. Here, as you see, it is an active hydrogen excretion. So, if there is defect in this active hydrogen excretion, will be defect in the uh, acidification of urine, and the pH of the urine will be always above uh, 5.3, despite the level of the bicarb, because here. It is active situation and really this collecting duct is responsible for 
uh, excretion of the daily acid load, which is approximately 80 millimole through these two active pumps. Okay. How to differentiate between this is very important point. I know it is a lot of formula, but you can review this lecture several times. But it's very important. How can you differentiate between the diarrhea and the renal tubular acidosis? Simply by history. Simply by history. You can ask if this patient has diarrhea or not having diarrhea. Second, by urine pH. Urine pH, if the urine pH is above 5.3, it's going with renal tubular acidosis. But as you know, as we, we hear now, uh, in type uh, to renal tubular acidosis, LBH can drop below 5.3. And the patient in uh, laxative abuse he cannot mention that he has uh, diarrhea or she has diarrhea. Okay. So how can you differentiate between diarrhea and renal tubular acidosis? We'll get the other concept here, which is the concept of urine anion gap. Urine anion gap equal urine sodium plus potassium minus chloride. It is slightly positive or one. It's almost equal. Okay. Be at attention, please. The normal renal response to metabolic acidosis elsewhere in the body is increase ammonia production to buffer the excess secreted hydrogen ion in form of ammonium chloride. So. If the tubule is doing the good job, if metabolic acidosis happened by adding toxin to the body or by uh, whatever the situation, in diarrhea, in diarrhea, if there is a loss of bicarb and there is acidosis, the renal response should be increasing production of ammonia to excrete these excess hydrogen ions as ammonium chloride. So, the net result of this metabolic acidosis is increase of bicar of chloride. And increase of chloride, that means because renal tubule is doing the good job, will increase the chloride here, so the urine anion gap will be negative. So, if the renal tubule are doing a good job, there will be a more chloride excretion and a negative, negative urine anion gap and vice versa. So, if the diarrhea is the cause of normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, the urine anion gap will be negative because tubule is normal. But what if, if the problem is the tubule itself, as in case of renal tubular acidosis? In this situation, the urine anion gap will be much, much positive. Okay? So please, if you find normal anion gap, take a history to differentiate between diarrhea and renal tubular acidosis. Do a urine pH. If it's more than 5.3, it's going with renal tubular acidosis. And at the end, do urine anion gap. If it is negative, that means the tubule is doing well and it's diarrhea. If it's positive, that means it is renal tubular acidosis. Fifth step, you should always ask about the respiratory acid-base balance in metabolic acidosis. As all of you know, in the metabolic acidosis, you will find the patient has cosmal respiration, hyperventilation, deep breathing, because as you know, BH equal bicarb over BCO2. If the bicarb decreases, the body will try to decrease the BCO2 to compensate and normalize the BH and to compensate for this decrease by car. This is a cosmal breathing. We'll wash the excess uh, CO2 to normalize the pH. But to what extent this ha will happen? It's not an unlimited process. There is an expected BCO2. So with any metabolic acidosis, you find you search for expected BCO2, which is 3 over 2 multiplied by, by carb plus 8 plus or minus 2. If B expected BCO2 is more than expected, in metabolic acidosis, there is concomitant respiratory acidosis because there is retention of BCO2, of CO2. If it's less than expected, there is a much, much wash than expected, it is respiratory alkalosis. Okay, let us uh, find some case problem for this. This is at 27 years, we need to apply these rules now in these uh, cases. 
كيس 1 a 27 year female patient type 1 diabetes related since 15 years admitted to ICU because of severe ketoacidosis precipitated by gastroenteritis admission ABG B87.2 BCO223 BO280 by carb 10 serum lights chloride uh, 111 sodium 133 potassium 3.7 serum albumin 2 what's your assessment in this patient First step, it is metabolic acidosis because low BH and low bicarb. Second step, I will search for uh, uh, anion gap. After measuring anion gap, sodium minus chloride plus bicarb. After getting this anion gap, I will adjust for albumin. So I will get the actual anion gap. After that, I will get delta gap, which is anion gap minus 12 over 24 minus by carb to see if there is a combining uh, normal and metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis and lastly i will see the respiratory compensation is it right or wrong let us see anion gap was 12 adjusted anion gap for albumin was 17 that means it's high anion gap metabolic acidosis let us see delta gap delta gap 17 minus 12 over 24 minus the patient by carb, it's less than one. So there is concomitant or mixed normal annual gap metabolic acidosis because there is a lot, there is much, much loss of by carb than expected from high annual gap metabolic acidosis. Expected BCO2, it is almost normal. Right. What is the explanation for that? What do you see? Diabetic ketoacidosis induced high annual gap metabolic acidosis, but the diarrhea in gastroenteritis induced normal anion gap metabolic acidosis okay uh, both that, this is other parameter when the patient was treated by normal saline and insulin with potassium chloride next day if you look for this uh, BH uh, acid base it is only only normal anion gap metabolic acidosis because of normal saline what else this is a 65-year man with, who was admitted because uh, with one week history of severe diarrhea. He was weak and dehydrated with blood pressure, a uh, subine position 100 over 60, lying but sitting it is 70-40. There is significant drop of blood pressure. His lights and the EBG as following. Sodium 132, bicarb 5, potassium 2.5, BH 7.11. BCO2 16, chloride 110, albumin 3. What is your approach to this patient? First step, low bicarb, low BH, it is metabolic acidosis. Second step, I will search for anion gap. Sodium minus chloride plus L bicarb. Third step, I will adjust for albumin. When I get the anion gap, I will search for delta gap, which is anion gap minus 12 normal over 24 minus the bicarb to get the delta gap to see if there is a covering non-anion gap metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. And lastly, I will see the expected BCO2. Is it expected or more or less? Let us see. Anion gap 17, adjusted anion gap with albumin. Leia, I will remind you again. Layer annual gap plus four, which is normal annual albumin minus patient albumin multiplied by 2.5. It is this adjusted actual annual gap 19.5. What's the delta gap? 19.5 minus 12, which is normal annual gap over 24 minus patient by car. It is less than one. So there is high annual gap metabolic acidosis with mixed with normal annual gap metabolic acidosis. Expected BC2, it is expected, no problem with respiration. What do you think? Diarrhea induced normal annual gap metabolic acidosis with hypovolemia induced lactic acidosis. What else? A 49 year woman known case of rheumatoid arthritis admitted because she felt very weak, anorexic, lethargic, with dry mouth, she, rheumatoid and the dry mouth. She didn't have diarrhea. Serum chemistry, sodium 135, Potassium 3.1, chloride 110, random blood sugar 120, creatinine 2, ABG BH 7.31, BCO2 26, BO2 87, 
by carb 14 albumin 4 what is the next step okay let us step by step where is the bh bh acidotic by carb low it is metabolic acidosis i will do anion gap sodium minus chloride plus the bicarb i will adjust the anion gap for the albumin i will do the delta gap to see what's going on anion gap 11 adjust anion gap 11 it is normal so i am i am talking about normal anion gap metabolic acidosis what are you going to do no diarrhea but the patient may neglect but no diarrhea so i think about real tubular acidosis so i need to do bh of the urine and i need to do urine anion gap urine bh 5.6 going with the real tubular acidosis urine anion gap sodium 29 potassium 33 plus minus chloride which is 29 urine anion gap it is highly positive high positive here minus it's a high positive value denoting failure to secrete sodium chloride which point to renal tubular acidosis is this patient has Jogren syndrome which is uh, one of the cause of renal tubular acidosis okay this is nephrocalcinosis you, you you consider type 1 in nephrocalcinosis